the artist. All right, so we're back at this thing yet. When we left, when we left the uh, comp dash go, uh, there was some discussion about how performant using interfaces is, and it was tr it was discovered that interfaces are using reflection. That I that and I probably want to do a lab on that. Um, and so that'll be so that'll be a, a separate video or series of videos. I want to do a lab that actually for once and for all settles the performance question about the use of interfaces because if there is any performance hit at all for using interface i really want to know about it um and the fact that it's using reflection at all just really disappoints me and i was unaware i still have to see it from my own eyes i i trust the people that are telling me that it does but if that's true then you know, there's a lot of reasons to not use interfaces, particularly the way I have been using them. Uh, I've been using them because I thought they were sort of a, uh, a co an organizational coding thing that were completely irrelevant after after it got compiled. That they were essentially that was just that was essentially just used for uh, compile time checks for typing and everything like that. But it didn't have any indirection at all. That there was no no impact or performance at all. That's the way I've always understood them to be. But but that was wrong. I think I was wrong. People are telling me now um, that uh, that it actually does impact performance, and you can check it out yourself with a benchmark. And someone has suggested to look in the runtime module, which I have looked in before, but I wasn't ever looking for that. You know, the inner runtime uh, package library for Go, which has all of its actual internals. Um, and 1.17 has gotten really good with tree shaking and making things efficient and more inlining and all that jazz. But but if there if there's any any performance impact at all from using an interface i want to know because then the decision to use an interface versus a struct becomes a much more important decision it's not you can't just say you can't just say hey you should always pass an interface and you should always return a struct which is the sort of sort of running mantra and best practice and rule you can't say that if you've um you know spent a lot of a lot of effort uh you know, doing a bunch of interfaces, especially the way I use them, because I've been using them extensively as a method of, of cleaning up my code organization by, you know, doing one method interfaces that have full documentation for what that interface does and should do, and then combining those together into a bigger interface when I need to make uh, something bigger. And and that is that is two levels of indirection, which is even worse. So uh, I have seen that used a couple times, but the the... The consensus so far uh, from the other people who've been doing this for a while uh, is that that is that is that is a, I mean somebody said ten performance perform ten percent performance I don't I don't think that's true but there's no way for me to know it and the and the performance it would not hit anybody using the struct directly by the way it would only affect those passing the struct which is you know when the performance gets hit it's going to hit you. Um, so just to recap, um, I have all these one method interfaces that I've created for all the right reasons, for the flexibility of being able to have anything use this, you know, conf and then not care about the provider. In fact, having gone through this, I've really re rethought what I might want to call um, the the actual, uh, I, I might, I might want to reconsider what I'm even going to call the, wait, they didn't pick up my title change, why not? That was weird. It didn't pick up my title change. The topic didn't change, so I'm trying to figure out why. So, I wonder why. Yeah, I don't know, that's weird. Twitch is not behaving. There we go, all right, so. Uh, so that, none of that. Anyway, so we got these. These things can probably stay, but I need to get rid of the main one. And we need to refactor that, and that's going to take some time. I might not be able to finish that all tonight. I might just bail and go play a game or something because it's not that much work, but still, um, it parses data and adds the key value pairs to the internal struct from parse bytes. Um... I am kind of re rethinking the entire interface itself. Um, 
in terms of what if I have more than one struct that needs to use the interface? Uh, and and that's that's kind of where I want to start. So there's gonna be a lot of brainstorming going on tonight. Probably not a lot of fun stuff to watch. Um, so there are things that are interesting, but that's what that's what I'm gonna do. So so we have I changed the name already to a map to a property struct. So let's let's figure out what kind of things we want to have in this. I'm gonna put this in the README. Um, so hmm. we can actually add back backward compatibility here as well. Alpine is a piece of art. Super tight, tiny like that. Yeah, it's pretty light. Um, I might just have to chuck this whole thing and recreate it. Because then they just move the pieces over. That might be the better way to do it. Yeah. Because if I do that, then we get... I don't know. Let's do this. Let's do... Let me restore the map the way it was. I'm trying to think. I'm just trying to think of how all the different interfaces we should do here. And I don't know where to put the notes. I'm just going to put them here. So we need to do. So the way this is going to be used. It would be something like this. You'd have go dot. No, you'd have, uh, so you can do m equals a conf dot new map, right? And that should get you a new, but see, that's the way we have it doing it, and that gives us a map. But they're all going to be maps. So now it's going to be a matter of, it's just key value pairs. And I'm, I'm, trying, to th I'm trying to think of how the, the whole design could change potentially. So... We could have b equals conf dot prop. Uh, properties, right? That would give you a new properties object. Um, yeah, and I'm going to check packages. Last time I did not have edge enabled. Oh. So, I almost don't want to do conf anymore. I almost want to do persistent or source, you know. Um, I kind of want to make the interface name source. So, if we do this, then we can stuff all of the... If we do interface, we can put all of our get set and everything in here. Right, get, set, sync, uh, read, write, and such. Um, and we could probably get, I don't, we, can, we might be able to lose sync because when you, when you open it, right, when you open a source, it should just read everything from that source, even if it's not there. If it's not there, it should make a new one. I mean, that's that's all that that does. So it gets that read write. Um, so. A conf dot source. So this would be a conf dot source. It'd be get you can get and set. You can read. It's got it's got as you know it's synchronized, right? So you could do. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to do. No, we don't. That's it. We just want to be able to get set and read right to the thing. That's it. Actually, we want we want get and set to be persistent so that they'll automatically write to it 
You know, if we really trim this thing down, all we really want is getting set. That's it. That's really all we want. We don't care about anything else. I'm trying to really hone this in. Um, so it can use any compiler. Alpine is just a super lightweight distro. It doesn't have, you, they're probably use glibc on there, but a lot of time, no, they use uh, muscle. Yeah, I was going to say muscle. It runs on muscle. Yeah. Um, so new map, we could do conf dot, uh, I mean, we'd have to make one. We'd have to say, are you, um, I, I think I want to put new under here to say we have a new one. But see, the thing is, I don't even know if we need the constructor. I mean, it, the constructor would be a nicer way. Okay, so let's try this. I don't know if we call it map, but we could say, we could say m equals conf uh, new conf dot what, right? A new conf, uh, st standard, a new conf file and that would that would be like one file at a time or you can do new conf that new file but then it's like well what kind of file is it right so i want to say source i'd say new uh, conf source. What is this source? It's like a new, uh, a new, uh, file source or prop file. Uh, and that is either going to make the file or it's going to, I kind of feel like if we provided the file name, but I wanted to kind of infer it as well, you know. Uh, oh, the kids? Yeah, they're right outside our house. There's little kids outside. They're funny. They're really funny. Uh So new conf, conf stuff, uh, new file. Um, huh. I have a hard time with this because I know I'm going to be using it a lot. So. I could, instead of doing the source, I could just say it has a getter or a setter. I don't have to say all the rest of it. But how am I going to use it? This is the question. So I'm going to say, uh, I mean, if it was inside of a, no, this is how I use it up here. New comp file. I don't, I want it. It doesn't seem as elegant as before. So. I can make this, this is actually hand constructing a new config file. So it'd be like, okay, you're going to make a config file and here's where it's going to live. And you're going to use that. And that doesn't take very, very much work, but I want to make it super easy to add. I think we could make the file default, a default to a key value pair. Um, I don't know if we could call it a map file or whatever. Right now we're calling it a map. I think maps are fine. 
We should probably say new from. Yeah, that might be the way to do it. We could do new from, we could do new from JSON. Yeah, and we would need to have this take, uh, this could take, this is probably a variadic thing. I could probably put a variadic thing. I don't like variadic, but you know. Now we could say new from file. Uh, I don't know if I want to do that. New from like path to file. But that doesn't have any of the XDG stuff built into it, you know? I could do that. I could do new from XDG. Is it XDG or XDF? XDG. So XDG. New from XDG, new from file path. And is there a way to detect the MIME type of a file? And go. I don't think there is. Our media types. Yeah. Magic numbers, go routine safe. Hmm. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I probably want to do this. We wanted to have that be explicit anyway. So new for file. Alpine is designed for shipping projects with it. That's the whole point of it. So. Uh, new, new from JSON, uh, it would just be a reader. Yeah, we could just do a reader here. Uh, yeah, we would do that. New from JSON. Uh, I don't know if we would do new or load. Some reader. See, this is why that's in direction too, right? So. Yeah, we would definitely want a reader though, because then you could just, it's easy enough to open up a file. So we have to we have to be able to tell what format it is though. Uh, if we did it as an argument, that seems un, un bad. You knew from YAML. I mean, we could make it be a reader or a buff. We could do load from YAML, load from all that. New from JSON, new from YAML. Uh, and then I'll know how to write it back and forth. But the thing of this is you'll be able to interchange them and you can say, you know, write as JSON, write as whatever. So I want to be able to go back and forth between my configuration files, including TOML. So the TOML is just a key value pair thing. So it's a, that's the important thing. I want to make sure people understand that this is just key value pairs. It's not more than that. I don't. I don't want to have an extensible configuration map finish maps based interface. Uh, yeah. Hmm. WebKit to two GP. I don't know. Interesting. It can't hear me. Well, I'm definitely streaming. 
and I, my voice is coming through. So, uh, here's the thing: it's not really, it's not really new. Uh, uh. It's not really new at all. It's more of an open thing. Yep. So, open XDG. Yep, I'm going to redo all of this. <laughs> all right, if you say so. Uh, open XDG, open. I'll just say. I'm probably going to just keep open. I'm going to reward the people that use my interface by just doing conf.open. And that's going to be some file path to a file. And then uh, OpenXDG just does what the OpenXDG stuff does, should do. And that's going to give you a new one that it'll then write to. New is the wrong word. It always has been. You fall into stream watching the stream. <laughs> well, that's okay. Thanks for that. I hope that helps. I definitely put people to sleep. <laughs> for better or worse. Mm. All right. So we have uh, conf.open. The path to the file there. We have conf.open xdg path to file. Uh, what else we got? Um, I think, I think we have, that might be it. Let's try this. We have open, we can do open, this is what we can do, open JSON. Um, YAML. And we'll do YAML. ATOML. I don't want people to get the wrong idea though. Uh, this is not going to be anything. It's never going to be more than a key value pair combo. So we could actually open a database if we wanted to. We could say, uh, or, you know, any kind of SQL source. So you could do OpenDB and you would just have to put the identifier. Um, Open. SQLite path to. What do they name those things these days? I think it's like SQ2, right? SQ2. What is the. For a SQLite. File. We want XML. It's just simple key value pairs. That's the thing you got to keep remembering. <laughs> Net surf and VI bindings. Nice. Uh, SQLite file. S SQLite. three or dot db thanks for that so if we open this file though we probably should be more generic about how we use it um you really want xml i mean that would be a really pain in the ass to parse but because it's just going to be key value pairs right um yep open xdg xdg is going to assume a regular open but it's going to be the default limited file format um a key browser whatever makes you unhappy <laughs> yeah so 
I think this is headed in the right direction. We don't want a lot of news. Um, I mean, if we're going to have a new, it needs to make a new file. Right? Uh, we'll say, we'll say new path to file. We'll say new XDG, which has it implied. Um, so I'm going to put here open implies implies new if no uh, file is found. So it will call new if it doesn't find it. <laughs> yeah. Um, we don't need any of these others. Actually, we do. We, we are all the same. So let's do that. So let's... Uh, Open JSON, we do new JSON. All right, SQ light, no S keys. Um, so these ones actually make a new one and then return it. Uh, this is, these are all gonna have to have an error, I'm afraid. I hate to say it, but that is the right way to do this. Because if I can't co create the file, I have to communicate back why I can't. Same with all of these. All right, so... And if they want the, the raw struct itself, we can give them that. Now, the question is whether we're going to have the inter, how we're going to define the interface for this. And that's really the reason I did this. Perl script and leverage both. Yeah. Uh, yeah, tell me about the sites requiring JavaScript. You can get around them. I, it's not that hard to find a site that requires JavaScript. Check it out. So, so I can go to my hated site, Quora, and it'll say, sorry, you can't read anything. Uh, but then if I, oops, wrong one. So that's the wrong one. It must be something else. What's, how, what is it? What is the site name? So... So you go to Quora, so what I'm trying to say is you go here, Facebook Quora, YouTube Quora, Instagram photos, etc. And no, that's weird. Oh, wow, that's like really far down. Uh, like the actual Quora site is not the first hit. <laughs> and that's crazy. So Quora.com apparently. So let's go to Quora and it says, sorry, you can't see it, right? Watch. And then you just press, if you're in links, this is why it's so fast. If it's in links, you just press comma and it will open the site in this web browser so you can see it. Now, it's not letting me access it for whatever dumb reason, which does make me wonder, do you have to sign up to see it now? Do you have to sign up to even be able to open it? That's new. That is really new. Maybe they detected my IP and they banned me. <laughs> or am I spelling it wrong? Shit. Uh, did I get this wrong? Oh my God. This is crazy. When did they when did they block it? They they finally put a paywall up. Holy shit. You can't access it without an email now. 
That is insane. So let's answer, let's get a question. It's like, when did, this is crazy, put up a paywall? Uh, all right, so you can't see it, right? So put comma and it opens the question in a regular web browser. So then you can just go read it and it's just like one extra step. So I do all my browsing using text and then occasionally when I need that, I just pull it up, pops right up. So it doesn't, doesn't hit me at all. So that, that's what I need to do a video about that, but yeah, I did answer that question and it was answered on Quora. <laughs> That is just so crazy stupid. Um, so anyway. Uh, I'm going through this design some more. So what is this structure going to look like? Uh, well. Only implies new if, if no file found. Okay, so. Yeah, we can put that right here on open. Uh, let's do... Let's do that. Put the, the news up here. All right. And then, uh, no, you cannot. You cannot use C++ and C. Uh-uh. Backseat programming. How's it going? Uh, how about only having one new and overloading it and one load? Yeah, I thought about that, but uh, that... I like that, but I also want to make it more succinct. Does that make sense? So that I'm about to do the next thing. So, um, yeah, because I mean, this is a config. I want to, yes, I want to have it be a dramatic go, which means it does everything one step at a time, but I also don't want to, um, overcome the convention, the convenience of the, even adding an error return call is already going to annoy people. Because now they're going to have to check to see the error code if it works and stuff, and they're going to hate that. But whatever. So the other possibility I was getting at here is you could do this. You could just make a new one. So if we if we make the underlying struct uh, the same, and we kind of can do that. That's one of the reasons I'm doing this because all of these paths are are the same. So we could actually make the underlying struct. We could say a conf dot map, right? This is go. Yeah. Go is object oriented. Yes. In every way that matters. Structs are not objects. They're structs <laughs> that can have methods associated with them. They're called receiver methods. Uh, bash, bash it too much. Lol. Uh, yeah, there's no classes at all. That's the biggest thing. You make a struct, and then if you decide you want to have a method that is, goes with it, you just hang it off of it. You tag it onto it. It's really cool. So, so we're gonna have a map. So a map is a map is a new raw ob ob item. It's not a map is a, a new struct. A conf map. A conf map is you know a key value pair store. Uh, that's whatever. And so I'm kind of, I'm kind of seeing where this is going to go. If you do new, it will, you know, do a lot of the extra magic for you. Right. Um, and inverse interfaces, I don't know if you call it that. I, tell you, I don't know how I would characterize it. I don't think I would call it that, but so the op alternative here is to do this. So we could do M dot load or, you know, and then, uh, you know, you could do so conf.open, but then you could do m.open and take it to a path file. The problem with this is that this map, this map now has to know how to open itself and that we don't want to put that. We want to put the functionality about how to open something into the struct and not into the interface. So we're going to leave that part out. But if you want a map and you want all the raw stuff from the map, you can do that. So the map would be, 
and I already have this. So I'm just, I just kind of trying to get a sense of how the whole thing's going to look together when it's finished. Uh, so the map would be what it would be type map struct. So, and Uh, a map is a specific base object that holds the data. Very, very simple. We just put a mutex on here. Uh, we probably want to do a read-write mutex this time. I mean, it's still an overhead, but it's less. Uh, go for Java programmers, yeah. Yeah, the type keyword. Yeah, it's backwards. I like it. Um, so we have sync RW mutex, and then we have. So that would embed a mutex, and that's fine. That's got a read write and un un read write and all that. Um, and then and then we would have we'd have our map, our internal map. Map string string. This is by it has to be a map string string. That's I'm really solid on that. And we would have something like this. Whether or not we make that pop, we we'll probably make it public. So if you did a new map, then you get a you get m dot m as the internal map structure. So if you want to go straight to the internal map, you can. Uh, and then we would have the I mean the get and set and all that, but I'm trying to think what what other thing we would have the internal path. So so, I guess we would have. I guess we could have that be kind of like a a URI. You know, uh, or a URL. Yeah, we could have something like location the map, the map location map dot location. Uh, back to the Python world. <laughs> so, map, uh, I suppose we could have source or persistence or something like that. What is the source? Um, and then we could have that be just a string. So this is this this string tells you what it's going to connect to. Uh, yeah, and we can't. The thing is, people can't aren't going to be subclassing this, so they're going to be be using this. So this is going to be like the one truth, the like source of truth for where the source is, and. The source is going to be different depending on this. Yeah. I mean, we could almost say it was a file and just make the whole thing file based. But I kind of want to make it so that if they want to talk directly to Postgres, they could do that. Oh. Uh, if they wanted to put their configuration Postgres or Redis, how would they do it? You know, what would they do? Would they they put a source path and it would be like a URL, it'd be like HTTP, whatever, right? Uh, and then we're the thing about this is that we're building, we're not allowing new sources to be built. If we do it this way, though, this is what I wanted to get away from. So. I want these to be different implementations of the same interface. Uh, and so, so source should probably not be, we actually don't need source. No, this is okay. So what is this even, what is this? So this is the base store for, for key value pairs. It has a mutex and it has a string and it has, I mean, it, it doesn't know anything else. It just, and, and where it's going to write, I guess that's all it knows. 
but could you use this struct to build on to make to make your other your other stuff uh yeah i think it i think i think it just needs to file i think it's just file honestly it's just file and depending on what your thing is it will change how it gets created and written and stuff so this if we do this we're going to actually have to have multiple structs with different with different implementations of the writer yeah so we'll have we're not going to be able to reuse the code from from map we won't be able to say okay you are a subclass you're a yaml writer i'm going to override your 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 writing method that doesn't work it does that's not a go thing uh yeah do i think it's good to go doesn't support objects uh it depends on what you mean by object people have got crazy ideas about that is it good that it doesn't create and just support classes hell yeah if for no other reason than one level less of indentation uh so i mean i think it supports that uh yeah uh, class-based object-oriented programming is a big fucking error. It was one of the worst things that was ever invented and put on planet Earth. Uh, go watch the talk from Jim Coplane, one of the original Agile Manifesto signers, and he'll tell you what's up about objects and why the whole world was fucked over by classes, specifically by Objective-C, C++, and Java, because they did it wrong. They did it completely wrong. They completely threw out the vision of object-oriented programming and created class-based object-oriented programming, which is not the same. It's not the same at all. Objects are supposed to be flexible enough to adapt to the mental model of the user and the, and, and the state of the situation that's going on. Uh, yeah, that's the whole, it's a whole banana thing. Yeah. The banana problem is a, is a side effect of them not fucking doing it right from the beginning. And getting everybody to buy into it. It's not just inheritance. It's it's classes in general. You know, it's the idea that you're going to have a blueprint of a thing that's never going to change. Monkey patching is actually a good thing. And Jim complained his exact words. He said, is anybody here coding JavaScript? This is a very serious computer science, you know, scientist. And he said, if you code JavaScript, you might have a chance of writing object oriented programming. Because you're supposed to be able to adapt your objects while during execution. So languages that don't even have anonymous functions and can't can't change. The idea, a method is one way to do a thing. You're supposed to have an operation and then a method. And you have one method that implements it, walk. Okay, so I walk, I ambulate with like two legs. Uh, another thing might ambulate with six legs, right? A different method. You're supposed to be able to swap out the methods for doing things based on in detection of the environment or different situations. But to do that in a class-based world is like the whole fucking building falls over because it's not designed to be that adaptable and that to that, to be able to be that flexible. And that that's the entire point of OOP, but nobody knows it because the guy who invented it, OOP was fucking ignored. And then when Java came out and they did their own thing. So, uh, see if I forget OOP. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's, the concepts, a lot of the solid concepts from object-oriented programming are totally sound. A encapsulation, you know, uh, those, I mean, that's the main one. Delegation a little bit is fine. I think that's fine. Po polymorphism, as implemented in class-based programming, is, you know, they call it the go-to, right? It's as bad as go-to because it locks down the paths, like the banana tree path, like I just talked about. So... But there are other ways around it, and that's kind of what I'm thinking about right now. Uh, this is going to be a, a very heavily used uh, library. That's why I'm giving it so much time and attention. Uh, I've done so many different configuration modules in my life. Every time I always feel like I just barely missed. <laughs> it's like pretty close. You know, I want to make a unified configuration package that all of at least my stuff can use safely uh, and know that it's not going to end up having to be recoded later when, when the interface changes or when some, something about the API changes. And, and I primarily want to read data, configuration data from 
one of any number of sources, and that would include HCL. I want to be able to plug in different parsers and engines that handle its structs, but I also don't want to break the interfaces of things that use the configuration data. So if you pass in a configuration, this is somewhat like a context, except for uh, I want you to be able to change it, and that's that's where context. I actually, I'm, I'm going to look at it a little bit. I there's a big part of me that that is kind of inclined to look at context even closer now, and start to use it for data propagation because because it's so much faster. But I don't know if I want to do that or not. So with GoLang, you can pass you can pass data in a context but you're not supposed to you're not supposed to heavily depend on it so but the i so one of the the ways that they achieve speed is that they freeze it they freeze a map pretty much and say you can't do anything else uh bypass the vm it doesn't bypass the vm i don't know i'm talking about original memory it has a garbage collector that's what you're asking, which is fine. Most modern languages do. You actually want a garbage collector most of the time. That's one of the biggest fallacies is that it's a bad thing. Um, package context defines a context type, which carries deadlines, cancellation signals, and other request scope values across API boundaries and between processes. So this, this, this has got me really rethinking generic is coming out. It is. Yes. Uh, this has got me really, really questioning my intention for the ConfGo module, period. Because the the this is much, much... I mean, somebody reminded me today, too, about how much more performant a context. I hate context. I really hate them. But this is how you pass data. It's, it's basically, if you have... If you have a scenario where you might have coded something with bash and use the environment variables so that the other things can be passed down, right? And you change it before you call it the, 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 the environment, you know, so I should probably make a video about this, but the functional equivalent of setting environment variables and then calling a sub process that can then pull those environment variables out, but cannot change them upstream, upstream, it cannot change them, that the functional equivalent of that model in Go is a context because you can set a bunch of key value pairs or you can just have the context be by itself and you, you call another one and then, you know, in, you can actually, you can take a context and then you can build on and create a new context that's a copy of the previous one and put all your stuff in there. Obviously, you don't want it to have a lot of data in there. If there's too much data, then it gets a little bit heavier. But the the... The, way, the reason you do that is because it's read-only, so they can they can do a lot, bunch of optimizations. And I heard today that that's a perfect opportunity to use map.sync because map.sync is just read from and never written to. So that would be, you would pass you would pass a map.sync to, a sync.map to a context as its only value. And, and then you could use that for communicating data. It would be a lot faster. And that would just be key value pairs, uh, but you could have any value in there. So there's a part of me that, you know, kind of wants to, to look at this. I mean, because I'm like trying to think, well, how is this going to be used? And that's always hard to, to pr predict how you're going to use this. The main reason I want to use this is because I just want to throw this in a file and I don't want to be reading arguments from the command line. I want, I want my arguments to just work. Um, and I want them to be key value pairs. I don't want to have... A lot of these other options to take the truth. I really just want these main ones. Uh, and and I just I just don't want to have to think about it. I just I want the persistent configuration file to just be there and to be updated when I set something. And so uh, that's the main that's the main purpose. Do what I would I want to make a JSON file or YAML file to import and all that kind of stuff? Probably. Um, would I want to use one of those for persistence as well? Maybe, you know, so I can say I want to persist it as JSON, I want to persist it as YAML, blah, blah, blah. I mean, those are all possibilities, but uh, straight to machine language? No, nothing does. 
there's no such thing. There's there's every single program on planet Earth except assembly compiles to a runtime with a yeah with a VM inside. You can't. There's there's yeah. I mean, it, whether you call it a, a VM or a runtime or something, I, unless I'm wrong, someone prove me wrong. But yeah, even Rust has got a super tiny runtime. It does have one. It definitely has one though. About Golang's way of error handling. I actually love it because it forces the error handling up front and I don't like having my errors be like 10 pages down. I like it. Uh, did you find it? Yeah. Go for Java programmers. It's really good. Uh, so, so yeah, let's think about this. So what is it that I really want to have this thing be able to do? Uh, I don't know if I even need all the JSON stuff, but I, I definitely want to be able to to implement the interface for the, when this gets passed to something. So when something's, I want to be able to have other applications that say, you know, I want to have another another uh, foo, right? A foo struct can say that it has a config and its type is a conf.map, right? But I, uh, yeah, that would that if by doing that, I, that definitely that's interesting. Yeah, I think I just answered my own question because I was going to have this be like you know a setter or something like that. No, I want it to be a conf map. That's the, so. This is actually not going to be a struct. This is going to be an interface and the map struct. So we're getting back to where we were before, uh, but now we need to say what type do we have, right? So interface. Uh, map. Oops, sorry. Type. And it's gonna not gonna be new comp map. It'd be new map struct. And this will just be a simple. I probably want to do a simple one. Uh, I could probably do map file. So I want a new map file. And then I I probably want a new. Uh uh, an XDG is just a map file. Uh, it uses uh, map file. It uses map file. And then over here, these are all, these are others, right? So they could do something else. I could have, I could say, I want to have a new map, uh, map JSON file and, and yeah I want them to be really verbose because because reasons yeah if, but if they want to struct by themselves they can have it now these structs are going to be redundant because they're largely going to be the same internally but they're going to all need to fulfill the map interface so this is the real key so type map interface and the only thing a map interface has to have, honestly, is read and write. That is it. It needs set uh, set uh, key comma value string with no errors. It needs a get get key uh, return string. It needs to set and a get. That's it. And it needs uh, you're it, yeah, preprocessor, compiling, assembling, linking. Yeah. So the get, set, and then read, write. That is it. And I was going to put a sync in there, but if you put sync in there, that it, then you have to make decisions about what happens when there's a merge conflict. Like if you have in memory stuff that's changed in the map and the persistent store hasn't changed, who wins? Right? Uh, that is a big deal. It's also something I want to build into this because it's it's important. Because like the whole idea of you have a file change out from under you while you're using VI, you have to be able to detect that, that the file changed before you write to it so you don't blow it out. 
So like if some other file is doing a configuration change, I want I want to set the policy for what happens if something changes. And that that is a core part of what I want to build here. Um, so this is like iteration two on this, but so yeah, and we probably that should probably be policy. Yeah. Um I mean, we could say if you want to have a map at all, you have to have these things. I really think we need to do that. This is probably the better way. And then it will simplify the interface. The problem is I have to document it. It's going to be hard to document because normally they'll there's this is complicated. The way the way the interfaces show up in the GoDoc documentation has always annoyed me because it's to document it you have to actually include the comments in there or you have to have the big freaking long comment at the top that that itemizes all your different things. It's just why I was trying to break out the interfaces and get them to be used one at a time. And I think this is this is much cleaner to do it like this. Um, so, yeah. Lo uh, imagine you could load, could not only load configuration from a file, but from a remote server. Uh, that's the point. Yeah. Something like etcd, exactly. Yes, absolutely. The, the problem I have here that's going to stop that from happening is... I am going to force a key value pair combination on this and basically a flat key value pair combination only. And if we define the interface, we don't care about the source. We don't care about the source, right? This is what these are down here. These are all concrete structs that implement the interface. So, you know, map file, map struct, or whatever. Uh, so we can have a map file, you know, a map file has a thing, uh, we can, we can say that the sets have to be safe for concurrency. So, um, you know, I don't want to put lock in here. Um, I feel like, I feel, I don't know. I'm, I'm on the fence on that. I feel like the map should be able to be locked. We can either do that or we can say all sets and gets are, are safe for concurrency, with, concurrency within the same runtime. We can force that in the contract. We can say, if you're going to implement a map, uh, how can we have object-oriented programming if it doesn't have classes? Go watch the the video uh, from Jim Copleen. C-O-P, Jim, C-O-P-L-E-I-N. And you'll be able, he'll tell you all about it. Uh, yeah, I can't teach it to you, but you can watch and you can maybe pick some stuff up. So... Yeah, absolutely. And then this, so uh, how do you say your name? Lu Lucenti? Lucenti, I, that, you're, that is exactly my goal. My goal is to create a common interface for reading configuration data quickly uh, from anywhere. And I there's probably already something like this. I imagine the, the Kubernetes config map is already pretty damn close to this. But I want to make a common interface that I can use that basically hides all of the details about where the data is coming from. I don't care. But I also want the primary method for parsing the data to be this file that, I, that I've that i been using for Bash. So the question of the interface design comes up. So do we need to provide a lock in the interface? Do we need to say lock? Do we need to say lock and unlock, right? Do we need to provide a read-write lock? Um, or do we, or do we, when we define the the rules of the interface, do we say, if you implement an interface, you're expected to do sets safely? That means you can't set a value. When you set a value, it's going to be automatically persisted. Okay. Uh, safely. That means it's going to be written and saved in a way that you can be guaranteed is not going to not going to hurt anything, right? Um, before you before you learn Go, learn some C. Alex Kurtzman Bell, sure words had never been spoken in a long time. Did he say that? Thank you. I'm going to I'm going to put that in my copy notes. I'm going to put that in my notes because I that you know that's how I've been doing with the boost, right? Before you learn Go, you can't get the Go until you get the C merit badge. <laughs> this is a true story. I'll be writing all about that tomorrow, by the way. Yeah. So, zit create 
uh, before you learn, go learn some C. Uh, all right. Thanks to Funk Man. Do, 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 do. Yeah, I love that one. I don't want to lose it, so I'm going to put that in my set. Okay, so, so this is automatically persisted safely. Uh, uh, so all functions are safe for concurrency. We're going to put that. Uh, All methods safe for concurrency in the same memory space. Um, and we're going to put automatically persisted. So, and if you get an error, then it didn't do it. So it's atomic. Right? So, and automatically persisted get, read, or write. So read is also atomic. Yeah, all, all methods are safer concerned within the same memory space. And uh, uh, all methods are atomic and safer concurrency. That means that you can't fuck with this. I want DB integrity. I want acid compliance in my reads and writes and stuff. Uh, so I don't, I don't, I want an ASA compliant API for reading set and gets. I don't care if it's a little bit slower. I don't care. What's that? A lot of people disagree with that, but I don't. At this point, I strongly agree with that. You didn't have to master C. You should just learn a little C. Uh, I'm presuming the same memory space. Uh, get and set, read, read and write. So, what else do we have here that we might want to, that we want to, we might want to do with that? Well, what do we have before? I don't. I don't. I want this to be usable. I want people to be able to create it. To subclass or create a context and actually add methods to the context, which you can do, that have set and get on it. They could do that and then do their own. We don't have to. I don't have to say how concurrency. That's probably the right way to go. Okay. I think I just answered one question. I don't have to indicate how atomic uh, you know, transactions and safe concurrency are achieved. I just have to say, if you're going to make a map, you are going to make, you're going to promise this to everybody. So if you say you have a conf top map, I can safely use your thing without any fear of setting and getting out working or reading or writing, having concurrency errors or stuff like that. And I really don't give a shit how you implemented it or if you implemented it as a server or if it's an interface to Postgres or if it's, you know, I just want you to make me a nice, clean, happy conf top map so that I can read data from it. The end. Uh, and I don't want to have to write some fucking, you know, crazy SQL to get the data. I just want my key value pairs, the end. And, and, and I don't really care about anything else. Uh, this is probably the reason that we're going to have to, we're going to have to trim sync off of here. Uh, other than C. Oh, hell no. C is so important to learn first. I've never been more convinced of that. I was kind of soft on that position like a while ago, but not anymore. No way. Not anymore. If you don't learn memories and pointer safety, if you don't, if you don't learn memory safety and pointers, you you can't call yourself a programmer. I'm sorry, you can't call yourself a a true programmer. You might be able to be a coder, but you can't really call. You just definitely can't call yourself a developer. Then I'm sorry, people disagree with me. I'm not getting mad at you. I'm just saying, 
if you have never learned anything but Java or Python and you call yourself a developer and you have no idea what memory pressure is and and what a pointer is, then you have no business writing code, period, particularly for an enterprise. I am so fucking sick and tired of programmers that have no idea how to deal with memory and and issues like this like punting and saying, Hey, I'll use Rust. It will keep me safe. Or I'm going to write Java because there's no issues there with that sort of thing. And then writing shit code. That's completely inefficient. It blows computers up. I'm so tired of it because people don't understand how the computer works underneath. And so what they end up doing is, is, you know, everybody, including me, including me for many years, for 10 years, for 10 years, I said, just learn Python. We'll learn about memory and pointers and everything later. No, not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. If, if you don't want to understand pointers of memory management, you have no fucking business doing any programming professionally. And since my focus is on teaching people to be professional programmers and not hobbyists, I, I think that that's the first thing they should learn. So like it's wax on, wax off. Pointers, pointers of memory management are wax on, wax off. <laughs> and you know, Daniel's going to come and scream at Mr. Miyagi. You just had me wash your fucking cars. Why am I doing this? I'm not learning anything. Show, <laughs> show, show me wax on, wax off because, and then he hates it, but then he realizes that by learning that stuff, he's now become the best possible developer or martial artist without even knowing it because he has the basics mastered. And now every time he writes code, he doesn't overly, he doesn't prematurely optimize, but he's thinking about it. He's thinking about it when he's writing his code, whether it's Python or web or this or that. He's like, man, there's no way that I could possibly be, be, be efficient to put that much memory, to load that much stuff into memory. When I probably could have, you know, put it over here in a file. And so like they'll understand all of that stuff up front and they'll be able to know what top is and everything like that. So, they'll go into it much more educated as opposed to having to tell them after the fact, Oh, that's why that doesn't work. Oh, that's why that's a problem. So I, I've completely changed my position on that. And I've, I've changed a lot over the years when I was trying to teach nine year olds how to go teaching him pointers of memory pressure. No memory. No, you can't, you have to get them to code enough to want to do it. And so you teach them Python and you teach him or Java. The thing that's really sad is that the, the people who pick Java for the academic standard have, completely ignored the, and I agree with the strict typing decisions now with the, why Java was picked because they want to, they want to pick a strictly typed language to teach, to teach, you know, you know, typing typed languages are really what you need to learn too. And that's another reason you should learn C first because C teaches you, you can learn bash. There's your loosey goosey language, right? But then you come back and learn C, you learn what types are. Yeah. You learn what pointers of memory. And once you learn those things, then you're looking at everything. You come to Python, you're like, okay, well, what type is this? I say, well, it's just a, it's just a string type. What do you mean? I was like, everything is the same type. Oh, okay. Well, what is it underneath? You know, you, you come to it with a, with a better, better, bit of a, a different thing. You didn't see, for, do you see at the university, but even before that, I've always kept in mind pointer memories. So, yeah. Uh, you're built different. Yeah. If you didn't see at university, you, you, you've, you've already, you've already got the knowledge. So it's kind of hard to distinguish yourself from, from that. If you've already done C and say, no, I don't think C should be the first language. <laughs> it's kind of hard, right? Because you already understand it. So it's, you know, honestly, I feel like, I feel like that's what I did when I picked Python as the first language for the new kids I was teaching and for the, and web development, I taught JavaScript and stuff. And I said, no, they won't do anything else because this is low hanging fruit and they want to get into it. And, and I, again, my, my livelihood was dependent on getting customers to come in and do it. So you had to kind of shave corners and say, look, I'm not going to tell everybody to hit the door if they don't want to learn pointers. <laughs> you know, it's like, I got to do things that they want to do, even if they don't know, they don't want to do that yet. Right. And, and then I have to kind of show them why they don't want to do it. Eventually I had to be more sneaky about how I taught and I'm not interested in doing that anymore. And frankly, it's neither are teachers, teachers, a lot of, you know, academic stuff. If they have the knowledge of why C is valuable, a lot of them don't. Right. That's, that's the sad part about educators in traditional American schools is that they don't, they just don't know. They don't understand it. There's a few isolated cases, but of all of the educators I've met, including college professors in charge of the computer science department at certain colleges that shall remain unnamed, they have no idea. They could not describe any of that stuff to you. And frankly, I, I've forgotten enough C to be dangerous. I don't think, I mean, I know that's going on underneath, but if I, if I was asked to code C professionally, I would be a danger to humanity <laughs> right now. I mean, I know, I know not to malloc, but I'd probably get some off by ones and stuff like that. And I don't know, 
I don't know what the what the you know the uh, I don't I don't know what the modern tools are to 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 check for overruns and stuff like that. I know there's a lot of them, but I don't know the ecosystem. I don't know the C ecosystem. I actually really want to learn it. Uh, I have to agree with you then. Your aunt has made your point more clear. <laughs> well, it's usually about misunderstanding, right? It's like the barrier to entry. Absolutely. So Jay, maybe you can help me with this issue since you you have the same concern that I had. So. I, for the longest time, I've been telling people, you know, Python or JavaScript is your first language. JavaScript is the most empowering language. Therefore, it should probably be your first because you're going to get the most out of it. And so it depends. What's your best first language is, is we, we had a great conversation about this. And it was part of a video that got just thrown out by YouTube. I was so pissed. We had a really, really educated conversation with QMacro and everything about picking your first language or two. And it was all about, well, what do you want to do? with the language and what are the criteria? If your criteria are, I want to be super powerful and I want to be able to deliver applications that people can use immediately. JavaScript is easily the first language you should learn because it's, you know, you can, you can deliver web applications to anyone without any overhead at all. And, and so, I mean, cognitive overhead to learning. Um, so for a long time, that was the first one. Python, I actually moved away from, yeah, Python I moved away from because, yes, it, it puts a lot out there, but it's not as empowering as JavaScript. Uh, it is useful to help you kind of get coding. It's, it, the syntax is, seems to be nice, but it has, this, it has this really dark flaw in that it teaches beginners to want ty uh, white space indentation and to avoid languages that use uh, uh, semicolons, I mean, uh, curly brackets. And I have seen this firsthand multiple times. I've seen Python ruin programmers because once they learn Python, they could not look at another language after it because they thought it was the best and then they get really cocky about Python and then they, they don't ever want to look at another language. So I, I when, in fact, when I saw that, I concluded to myself that I would never teach any language that wasn't C-like as a first language ever again. And, and here I am teaching Bash. <laughs> but Bash is just the command line. I mean, come on. C++. <laughs> Bash is just a command line. So it really is. You, you have to learn Bash first, but it doesn't really count. As, it is a language, but it doesn't it doesn't really count in your language count of like when you're because because you have to learn it. You have to learn Bash because it's how you do your configuration files. So so strictly speaking, you know, C in my new uh, view of the world is going to be the first language. Now, how much do we do is the question. How much do we do? Right. Right. So I'm the actual, the, the, I call it the, the badge name or whatever you want to call it. It's going to be C for comprehension. It's not, it's not C for mastery. It's C for comprehension. So you're learning C for one purpose and one purpose only to learn how your computer works. That's the only reason you're learning it. And as soon as you've got that done with a couple, you know, contrived projects, that's it. That's it. Maybe a link list. I think everybody should make a linked list and a node tree in C as their first project because they'll understand what's going on every time they use a dictionary. They'll also understand if they do a true, you know, I should probably identify a hash algorithm, a hashing algorithm that actually uses cache reads. Because if, if we did that as a project, they would never ask again when they go into Go, why are maps not safe for concurrency? Because they would understand because they wrote a C hash map algorithm, even if they copied it out of the book, they see that there's a bunch of writing to memory going on. And they'd be like, well, that memory is not this. It's, it says it's a read operation, but it's actually not, right? So if I, if I do C, and I'm, that will be, that's most likely going to be the badge that I'm going to have them do. I'll have them do two or three of the standard data structures, like a linked list and a rooted node tree and probably a hashing algorithm. And if, if you do those three things, we're not going to do binary sorts and bubble sorts. You kind of have to do the sorts anyway, though, right? Because if you're if you're going to write a hashing algorithm, I'm sorry, I'm I don't know if it's remembering or if I'm understanding it better, but the reason that you have to do bubble sorts and all that shit in when you're first starting is because in order for you to understanding hashing algorithm, you've you know every time you use a dictionary in Python, you're using using a miniature database. You're using a miniature database, and that database has been written is built into Python or whatever language. But it's a database, and it can be implemented in any number of different ways, depending on how you want to access it. And that's exactly the problem with sync.map 
in Go is it's been implemented one specific way that's really good for lots and lots of reads, but really horrible if you're going to write to it and then read from it later. You can do it, but it's not been optimized for that. Why? Because the internal little database engine, the hashing algorithm, has been tuned to a particular type of, of reading. And the reason that C doesn't provide those things by default is because there's so many variations in computer science, all this, you know, amortized and, you know, and number and, you know, all of that shit is all about how fast it takes, you know, computationally, theoretically to read from the thing that you're just trying to get a value for. So you don't understand any of that until you've written code in C, in my opinion, because C doesn't have it. I mean, it does, but it's add on extras, right? The built in fault of C, the computer doesn't provide it. So when you write it in C, you have to write your own dictionary. Uh, your first, your final year C project had to build a disk persisted key value store. The hardest part for me was trying to build a library that had all the data persistence and then use that in the main CLI program. Exactly. Jay, I was, I'm so glad you had that experience. You probably hated it. Uh, I, I'm so glad you had that experience though. Personally, I, I wish more people had had that. I wish I had had that experience. I did some C early on, but, but, um, yeah. So uh funk main says this is why i say that bash or the command line utilities should be the first because they they problem solve right they're empowering and uh, they learn and then learn c by osmosis since the kernel is written in c they can learn c simply from the three insert syscalls or functions yeah and that's you know what we should probably put some syscalls in in our c stuff so because when we say c for comprehension when we talk about c for comprehension that means you need to know what do you need to comprehend here? You need to comprehend that memory is managed. You need to comprehend what a pointer is. You need to comprehend that this array that you're using all the time is actually a linked list, right? And you're taking stuff out. You need to comprehend that what a node tree is and why you might want one. You need to comprehend hashing algorithms. And you need to comprehend that your C program, you know what, you need to know what functions are. And it's just calling a ton of other functions that the kernel itself is just a ton of C functions that are being called back and forth against each other. And once you know all of that, you know, you, you, you thoroughly understand how your low lying system works, you know, not, you know, down below assembly level yet, but, but yeah, I think, I think you're, you're yeah. I just, I just import or require them. Yeah. Set via the command line. Right. Well, and the other thing too, is that most people that are teaching you see these days are not teaching static typing stack versus heap. Aren't they the same? <laughs> Lol. Uh, sort dot sort i like sort i think i think you do need to learn sorts i i've i've had a my my position on that has changed i've been a very practical person so i don't like all that like boring computer science like link list stuff and then i i had to do peg and i had to learn root of node graphs root of node trees to graph and i i i forever will take back any of my slamming on on that because i had to go open up the data structures and algorithms bible and look it up and learn it all to be practical. And I imagine there's some other things in there that somebody once said, um, you don't know what you don't know until you learn it. And I, I kind of buy into that, but it wasn't until I read the prologue of data structures and algorithms in C, uh, from this guy who's a very practical guy. He got rid of all the theory and stuff from the book. It's a Riley book that I really, really got behind it. And I, I need to go through the book again because I, I need to learn it, but I'm too busy doing shit like this. What's that? Is the, is, is the context in HTTP request the same context as doing context like background? Yes, it is. It's the same sort of thing. Contexts are a pain in the ass, but they're an essential evil. And books on algorithms? Yeah, my favorite book on algorithms? I, look, I, I, haven't, I am not an algorithms professional. Okay, so let me just say that right now. If, if you want to talk to somebody who knows about algorithms, you might probably want to ask somebody else's opinion, but this is my current favorite book. I think I actually lost it because I've been reading it. Damn it. Where is it? I'm reading it and I got it in another room somewhere, I think. God damn it. Where did I put it? Where 
are you? Oh, there it is. All right, it's not this one, right? You guys know this book? I think I paid $170 for this book. Where's my price tag? This is the fucking Bible. Everybody has it. I hate it. I hate this book. I hate it with such a passion. It's insane. I have I have certain areas like where I have rooted root no tree, like here, that are done. This is like everybody's textbook. Everybody's textbook. And the people who write it just continue to make crazy gobs of money without ever being incentivized to do something that actually is easy for people to consume and read. I fucking hate it. I fucking hate this book. I hate it. I hate that it's over expensive. I hate that everybody has to fucking buy it. I hate that it's from MIT, so everybody thinks it's better than everybody else. This is my favorite book. So this book is written by a practical person. It's a very old book. It's about 40 books, 40 bucks. And and I love the I just love the inscription at the beginning of it. I bought a used one. And it's it talks about it he just he's just very down to earth. I hate uh yeah. Talking out versus Python. Yes. This is my favorite book. Hands down my favorite book. Because it 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 solidifies your learning of C and it's no nonsense. Uh techniques encryption. I don't know about that one. Algorithms and techniques, sorting and encryption. I don't know if I would do that. I don't give a shit about sorting and encryption. I don't. I just want to have a, a good practical idea of what a linked list is, what a double linked list is. So he's got he's got illustrations in here. It's good old it's very plain. It's plain and to the point, and yet you would still pass any kind of computer science interview because it's got it has like one table of computational complexity that goes over it. And he's deliberately is like, I fucking hate you know, overly pomp bombastic books. Where do you say? Dynamic programming solutions, randomization algorithms, and introduction to algorithms data. Uh, when he's 12, he used to play a game, blah, blah, blah. I actually started reading through this. I was doing kind of a series on it, and then I stopped. I might, I'm, that's why I lost it. I couldn't find it because I had to decide if we were reading it. I kind of want to read it again. I really do. I want to go through it. I just, where am I going to put it in time? You know, there's like so many other things. And watch me go play a game. Uh, when things of data structures, we normally think of certain actions or operations one would like to perform on them, such as blah, blah, blah. Um, here he says, uh, there are many books on data structures and algorithms, some books containing code for the C libraries, but this book gives you a unique combination of theoretical background and working code. These other books don't because they don't dare to pick a language. Algorithmic thinking because it's problem solving. Ooh, I might try, I have to try that one. Uh, right now, no, it's exactly the one from Kyle Ludon. Oh, Oh, mastering algorithms with C. I thought it was data structures, right? Uh, but this book gives you a unique, unique combination of theoretical background. It offers robust solutions for everyday programming tasks. Mastering algorithms with C avoids the abstract style of most classic data structures and algorithms texts, but still provides all the information you need to understand the purpose and the use of these common programming techniques. So the reason I like this book above every other book is it's written by a programmer for programmers showing you why you need to learn these things or you should have paid attention in school because he's he's used these things on the job as a as an astronomer i think a coder for no he was i think he was doing air traffic at one point he was writing actual code so that's what i really love about it is it's like a practical application of of the algorithms and the data structures and all the stuff that you normally get taught in school but don't have any association with it's like learning calculus without being told why and then later on going oh you know that derivative calculus you did well guess what tensorflow is entirely based on it and and you're like machine learning is, is a big oh really wow well now i get it you know it's like i want to know why i want to know the why why am i doing something mastering algorithms and parole is pretty good too yeah the real life progress for yeah it's pretty good too and uh what's the other one uh, enterprise business models from 
what's his face? That's another really important one if you're going to start doing enterprise programming. Uh, it has all the things like message queues and stuff like that that are that are kind of more meta than the data structures and algorithms. They're like they're like architectural approaches as opposed to like low level approaches, and they don't talk about that. They don't, they don't talk about enterprise approaches to to, to software development. Um, and I really I am so happy I read that book in the '90s when I kind of gave myself my own masters <laughs> because I I got a Russian degree, but I read I read so many books and written so much code. You know, not as much as others. There's still people way better than me, but uh, uses an exceptionally clean programming style in writing. Kyle Loudon shows you how to use the essential data structures such as list stacks, queues, sets, heaps, trees, priority queues, and graphs. He shows you how to use algorithms for sorting, searching, numeric analysis, data compression, data encryption, common graph problems, and computational geometry. He also describes the relatively efficiency of all these implementations. The compression and encryption captures not only give you working code with reasonable effective solutions, they explain concepts in the approachable manner for people who never had the time to ex or expertise to study them in depth. This is my favorite book. And I, I'm, I'm actually kind of mad that I haven't finished it more by now. I Some of the stuff I kind of already know, like the node tree. I started doing a, a video series on rooted node graphs, uh, rooted node trees for Go, and I actually use it in my peg parser, and I'll probably return to it at some point. Uh, there's just too many things to do. So, why not play a game? <laughs> I kind of want to. I, it's stressing me out. I need to stand up. I've been talking too much. Um, so, I, I'm liking this interface here. Uh, so, we just have to say, look, all I want is to be able to set, get, read, and write from the thing. That's it. Uh, now, we, I, instead of read and write, I was wondering if we should have uh, load and load and save, but I think read and write is the, is the way to go. Uh, so I'm going to say, say, we're going to say for this, we'll say um, persist uh, state. Uh, no. Load state. Uh, destructively. That means that if you call read and you have values that have not changed, that have changed in memory, they get overridden. So the yeah. Let's say overwrite uh in memory from source. Uh, persist state overwrite source from memory. So the problem with this I have is I need we're gonna need to detect changes and shit. So if there's another change, what do we do? You know. I mean, if we return an error. That's not an exception to be trapped and then try it again, right? We have to say, I'm sorry, I can't write to this because it's been written since the last save. We need to do that resolution. I don't know if the scope of resolving a, a merge conflict or a write or read conflict is within the scope of this interface. And that's a design decision and I want to make up front. So if I... All methods are telling safer concurrency uh, within same memory space. So if we say no matter what, a read will destroy an overwrite memory from source, and write will always overwrite uh, any anything. We are we don't have like a safe write. You know what I mean? Because the only way to do a safe write would be to read the current source atomically with the transaction lock on the source, and see what it is and see if it's changed and then write to it. I actually did this in in the file by writing a timestamp in the file and saying, look, has this file been written to since the last time? And if it has, you know, just refuse. Um, so, so, yeah. I think that this is the way to go and I should leave the, it to as an exercise for the programmer to figure out what to do when write returns an error and says, I'm sorry, that file has changed 
since the last time you wrote to it. I'm not, I refuse to overwrite it, you know, and that would be, that would be something that we, that we maintain. Um, I don't know. Overwrite source from memory. Yeah. I feel like I want to add more to the interface, but these are the main things. Persist overwrite source from memory. I feel like if so, if you have if you have more than one person, if you if you have more than one thing in the same memory space, or even in different programs, um, I mean, you're you just you said you're not. You're not going to, I don't know. I don't know if I want to do the, the whole VI thing where, you know, one overrides the values. I mean, most people wouldn't even think twice about this. They'd happily blow it out and just say, well, it sucks to be you. You had two processes running at the same time. So I feel like that's enough. Uh, uh, so yeah, this is this is also atomic. Um, this automatic persistence is going to be a bitch uh, in terms of so this is a configuration map. That means there's not there is no high performance demand for this, right? You're going to change the configuration value. That means you're going to have a pretty big I/O round trip, particularly if you're automatically persisting every set. If you're automatically persisting every set, then you know you 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 know that you're gonna have latency. Honestly, you're calling a function in the first place. So if you're concerned with performance, you're probably gonna be using the underlying data structures automatically, like the like a, the map internally and messing with that, right? Um so Yeah. Part of me wants to say you can provide raw here and give access to the underlying data structure, but then that's that's exposing a detail of its implementation that it that you should have no business seeing. You shouldn't you shouldn't care how it's implemented. Right? You just kind of want it's and this isn't Cobra, I promise. <laughs> Hundred bits? Shit. Thanks, Jay. Um Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Now I can go play a game. <laughs> I kind of do want to just play Dota or play Winter or something. I mean, this is this is good. I really enjoyed it, but I my brain is like melting. I mean, it's not that that hardest stuff. It's like this is. I really, really want to get this right this time because I'm fucking tired of ripping out my configuration APIs from the middle of the programs and utilities that I use. And you know what I'm talking about, right? This is why. Yeah, I wanted to get command box so right too because I even if I even if I don't use them that much, somebody else might come along and see it and go, "Oh my God, this is the cleanest API for this." Even if they don't use the API, they can modify it and use it for their own sorts of things. Uh, so we're not gonna make read write. Okay, so uh, synchronous say okay. Uh, uh, ensuring. Uh, these constraints uh, is up to the implementers. We'll say is up to those uh, implementing these structures um, that fulfill. Let's see. As if those implementing the structures. How about that? Um, the thing I kind of want to put a latency constraint on here. That's actually one of the things that killed Cobra. One of the things that killed you guys don't remember Cobra. It was really old, but Cobra was kind of a. It was kind of a this object request broker. It was this way to abstract objects over the network and still use them as if they were local in memory objects. And it failed for many reasons, but I believe the number one reason it failed was because people didn't know what they were working with. 
They didn't know they were working with something that was coming across the network. It's like it's like using a file system that's a network attached storage file system versus a physical one and not being told that that's the case. And all of a sudden, all your reads and writes that you were planning on happening within a second are now taking two minutes or two seconds to, to return, depending on the volume of traffic on it. And you can't do, you know, God help you if you put like a, a you can't because it's block storage usually for databases. But if you put it, you could do a SQLite file on a network attached storage thing. And you'd be like, why the fuck is it taking so long? Even though SQLite does great, great, you know, caching and stuff. So... So I'm a little afraid by adding a, that layer of abstraction on top of reading from a configuration and not saying where it's coming from. So like if I, if I'm all of a sudden, if I'm reading from an API URL, URL which is fine, uh, that implements the map, then, you know, how do I communicate that it's up to the, the implementers to communicate uh, average latency expectations? How about that? Um, uh, implementers uh, are expected to communicate um, implementers let's see must communicate um, uh, commonly expected latencies Uh, uh, depending on uh, depending on their specific implementation, I implementers must communicate expected latencies depending on their specific implementation. In other words, uh, for example, uh, uh, when fulfilling uh, get and set over the network uh, such uh, should should be um, I put should should such should be uh, well documented up front write to a temp file <laughs> I rename the file after all the writes are done is no, it's not. I wish it were. That what you just talked about is not atomic. I wish it were. You know. Uh, this is good in case the application crashes. And sure, yeah. I th actually, I think renaming a file might be atomic. Yeah, I think it is. It because it's it's an inode change. Because because you can have multiple people with the same file descriptor open at the same time and they'll be all writing to it. And you can change the file name, and they will none of them will be affected. That's actually one of the coolest things about ext4 or any of the ext file system stuff. I've always liked that. So yeah, I do think renaming is atomic. But the problem is, is that renaming when I kind of balked at saying renaming is atomic, renaming doesn't. It's not atomic in the sense that it prevents writes to the file. That's definitely not true, right? Um, if you if you create a new file, then that's different because it's a new inode, right? Um, so, and that so the, the act of like writing to a new file and then swapping that file out for the other one and deleting it uh, is generally okay. The problem with that is if anybody else has that file, the other previous file open, it'll it won't die. It won't go away. It'll still stay there. So because they're still using it, so. <laughs> So it'll stay around in memory still because they have the open file descriptors to it. I think you can probably force that, but that's usually not what you want. Usually, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, the standard way is to just create a to create a lock and var lock, var run lock or whatever, and then f lock that file, and everybody everybody agrees to do that. That's the standard. That's the standard way to do file system locking. But it's you gotta have everybody's gotta play nice. If they don't play by the game, it doesn't work. So, uh, when I get set over the network, such so should be well documented up front. Yeah, I, I just I'm really worried about this, so I'm making sure to put that in there because I don't I don't I really 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 don't want someone to implement some like really long winded Postgres SQL query from a Kubernetes cluster across the country across the world, 
and then you know with a three second latency and have them ha every time they change a value have them have them to wait four seconds for it to update every time just to keep the cache in, in sync that would that would be a pain in the ass <laughs> so i i want to make sure that people that implement it know that they're gonna i i Real, I feel really strongly that we shouldn't fuck with the interface more than this, though. If you get more than this many methods in an interface, I think it's going to start weighing it down. And this this, this is going to take care of a bunch of interface efficiency issues, which I'm going to entertain. When I feel more academic, uh, I'm going to create a lab. I might do this tomorrow morning, actually. Uh, I want to create a lab, a learning lab called uh, Interface Performance. Golang Interface Performance. And I actually want to create a lab that has benchmark tests of several different common uses of interfaces so that I have a documented, recreatable, objective uh, lab to show how interfaces can be abused and when you probably don't want to use them and when you might want to use them. So I still think interfaces are valuable for the purpose of what I'm doing right here, but I feel like uh, that would that would be a pretty substantial change. So, so this is going to be a config map. Now the problem with this being a config map like this, if I if I define so this is kind of a user, right? So a user says, hey, I've got this config map. Okay, great. And they don't know what type of map it is. They just know it's a config map. The problem with this is that they have to call set and get to get to it, no matter what. And they can only call that. They can't they can't say that it's a map file. You know, it's this would be the this the struct way to do it. So the struct way would be that. And they'd say, okay, I have a specific comp map file and I know about the internals of it. The more likely thing would be conf.map. So my config is a conf.map, right? So it would be, uh, you know, you could, you could it would be conf, you could even just do it be C. Um, in fact, you don't even have to do any of that. You could just have, oh no, you can't do that. I was, I was thinking about you could embed it, but you can't. Because it's not a struct, so you can't embed it. You can't embed an interface unless it's been implemented. So uh, foo.c could be the configuration. And you could have like... So, wait a second. Yeah, I mean, you could actually say... Foo has a config map. And most of the time, that's not going to be how it's going to be, though. It's going to be... Foo implements the config map. Now let's say that. Let's say I'm gonna say server my server as a, a Kafka map, and it can get all of its values and get them, read them, and write them, and know what's up. And then those values can change from whatever. And then you would have, yeah, my server would be serve server dot config dot get sum and then it would be set set some other um and that would change the configuration of your server so that your server would would read that every time and you'd have to make it so that you know your server kind of hops itself and when you make a change to it so that it it doesn't automatic. You you could keep it so there's runtime, right? It could be runtime change. Um, yeah. I'm I'm every time I see that though, I keep thinking about context because you could you could give your your server a con a struct a context and then just read the value from the context as opposed to this. But imagine this is fine config dot get see I, I kind of figure that people would do this instead though they would do get some set now we have a config object yeah I think that's the way to do it I mean because this, this is a remote configuration object I'm probably still going to have server dot you know foo equals one or something and those would be all the internal stuff this would be any exposed configuration source outside of there that that could be like changed out swapped out as, a, as opposed to reading my own configuration files all right so yeah 
Another reason I want to do this is I want to be able to start centralizing configuration information across multiple applications. But that's where the persistence problem comes in. Because let's say I want one configuration file instead of an environment variable setup, and I want multiple applications to read from that configuration file and use it uh, without fear of you know persistence and all that. So we could just have it read and we can make the read operation. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, our time I can save and with the same memory span uh, as And as possible, uh, with using uh, traditional uh, file system locking methods. So, so yeah. So for example, the read, I can make read use an F lock and var run and if F lock, if it detects it's Unix, I can implement read completely differently on Windows from from uh, Linux, and I can say, is there a var run file, is there a var, var run temp file, or var run file, a lock, and if there's a lock file, I can say, okay, if that file exists, let's go ahead and lock that file, and we'll get an f lock on the file, and then and then we'll proceed, and then everybody that uses it, that's using this particular one implementation of it would know that that was what I was doing. And I could document the fact that, that this um, read is using, is, has file locking built into it. So that would actually be good because then we have the upfront dependencies the up, up requirements of the map interface already there and communicated to anybody who wants to implement one. But then I could have the very specific implementation details here and say, okay, when you're doing a read using, using, uh, you know, the map file struct implementation of, of conf.map, then you are going to get a file level lock on Unix that's going to ensure that anybody that's, here's the method for it, and here's how you can do it in Bash if you wanted to, using just flock from the command line. Um, you could actually use Bash for configuration file. And that, that way we could use this, this, this whole API to do uh, a, a centralized configuration file across multiple applications, which I want. I want to be able to have that eventually. I want to get rid of de uh, ENV dependency um, because environment variables don't pass very well. Uh, there's lots of ways around that. People have been doing .env files. In the cloud native space, there's been a lot of experimentation about how to transfer environment in a Docker file once you get into Kubernetes and blah, blah, blah. And then you have you know, config maps in general, which are a whole you know, Kubernetes resource just for that very problem. Um, and... I want to start getting in the habit of building configuration sources from from a cons with a consistent API. That's the bottom line. So yeah, does new player mode put you up against bots? <laughs> Just wondering if it's a good practice before playing other modes. Are you talking about Dota? Are you talking about Dota? Uh, no, you have to play bots a little bit, but you can play other people. I'm actually going to go play it right now. I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, this has been fun. I'm, I'm, I got to let this simmer a little bit more. Uh, I already let it simmer today after being sort of disturbed by the revelation that interfaces are actually performance hits. Uh, that really made me sad. I'm not going to lie. That made me sad. There's no reason for that. I, I, the fact that it uses reflection just pisses me off even more. I hate the reflection library. I'm sorry. I mean, the reflection library gives us a lot of Python-esque things in and go, but I, I don't like it. <laughs> I just don't like it. quick question. What happens if one process go opens the same file configuration file twice and tries to write to it? Uh, will file level locking help here? Does it only protect against the other process? It file, first of all, file level locking, you cannot lock a file, that file, right? So the first, let me make sure you understand file locking. So to lock a file in Unix, you have to use F lock or the system lock command, uh, from F lock. Okay, and one of the number one misunderstandings of this, I definitely misunderstood it when I started, uh, until you have to maintain someone else's reflection system. Exactly, Jay. 
<laughs> so, so, so here I am like looking at F lock. So F lock is, it's a syscall. It's, it's, it's the traditional Unix way to do it. And what it does is it, it takes out a lock on a specific file, but the biggest beginner mistake is F lock. And we need to do a video on this is that they think that they want to call F lock on the file. That's going to have access. And that's not normally what's done because the file already has to exist. Right. So the traditional way to use F lock, if, if I remember right, someone correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and this is actually relatively standardized now. So on all, you know, most modern Linux systems, I imagine BSD as well, there's var run lock, right? And what people do is they will, hey, look, a sound uses one. They will create lock files. So the, the caveat from flock is it doesn't work on files that don't exist. So a lot of times you're saying, okay, I have this configuration file. I want to make it. I want to lock it, right? So you try to use that file itself for the lock. And you, but you don't know if that file is going to be there. Uh, you don't know what it's going to be named, and you can, you certainly can't be sure everybody else is going to name it the same, right? So if you if you want to use a semaphore that affects all processes, so what do I mean by that? Uh, or a mutex, right? This is kind of like a way to to force your own mutex across all processes on Unix. But they all have to play the game. If they don't play the F lock game, then they don't. They can override it, and they can do whatever. And that's kind of the that's kind of the, the downside of it. Um, so the normal process is you take you create a file. Your application itself creates a file that doesn't already exist in var run lock and with its own permissions. Um, and that means, uh, you know, let's, I'm trying to get the long permissions here. Yeah, that's owned by root. So hmm. I wonder if you could even create anything in there. Let me try. I think you can. Touch var run lock. I'm pretty sure it's a tempfs too. It is. It's temp isn't anymore. <laughs> it's like a virtual file system. Yeah. Blah. I think I can. Yeah, it's a tempfs. Yeah. So now I'm the only one. I can set my own permissions on it, something like that. So the process is this: you agree to have the same file to lock. The file almost never has anything in it, right? Uh, in fact, I'd be curious to see if that if that other a sound file has anything in it. Far run lock. Uh, a sound file that lock. Yep. Oh, look at that. that I, I'm guessing that's the process ID of the thing that's actually locked it. That's interesting. Do you see how it's like offset? You see how it's offset? It's got other data in here. <laughs> that's probably because it's it's writing to it in a weird way. Yeah, it's probably doing an F seek or something. I bet it is. That's curious. It's interesting. Uh, yeah, let me see something here. Yes, he has oh, one two eight. Nope. Uh. Huh. No, that I don't know what that is. It's got to be some sort of identifier, anyway. So the file is the, the important part is that the file you don't care. You just have a file, right? And so you lock the file, and you can lock it in any number of ways. But uh, if there's there are blocking locks, and that's what you have to watch out for. When you start to deal with locking, inevitably everybody who deals with locking it, and, and I imagine it's the same experience I had. They think that they want a a non permissive lock that blocks the whole world from doing anything to the file, and they inevitably forget to remove that. So then then the system goes down or crash. Anybody ever have this happen? The system will go down or crash or some bad thing will happen to your process and the lock is still there and your whole application is bork and the only way to fix it is to delete the lock. How many How many of you have ever run into an issue with production software where somebody was too zealous in their use of the lock and they created a system that had really bad fragility because the lock didn't clean itself up because there was this fatal condition that stopped the lock file from being removed. So th th this is why creating a file, it's funny, there's a few people. So this is why creating a lock file and depending on the lock file, you know, people use the, cre the existence of a file as a lock as a bad idea, as a bad idea. 
It's a bad idea because any number of things can go wrong to your system that are going to leave that file there. And what's going to happen to the next thing, right? You have to have, and if you're going to do that, you got to make sure you got intelligent software that knows, okay, we have this other lock here, but we don't have any other processes running, so it's okay for us to remove it. The only other alternative to that is to have to tell the user, oh, there's a lock, you need to go delete it. And the user didn't want to do that, right? But if, but if you're overzealous in removing the lock, then you prevent the purpose of the lock in the first place. You can't just overwrite it. So, so the reason that permissive locking has become kind of de rigueur, you know, it's the thing to do, is because it gets you enough to keep from overriding things and stuff like that without blowing you up if, if, if something goes wrong. And so that this we did a whole video on locking. <laughs> we just did a whole video on locking. This is not covered anywhere else. Nobody taught this to me. I had to hit all these problems myself. <laughs> So somebody needs to talk about it. And so uh, so in Unix, it's generally generally best practice is to just usually appending to a file is safe as long as you just use all the regular, you know, stuff. Um, and and you just don't think about it, right? You can concurrently uh, append to the same file without a problem, even though technically speaking, if somebody flushes in the middle of a line, they can fuck you up. Uh, writing the PID to to write writing the PID to the lock with Docker is also interesting. It's frequently PID equals one. Yeah. Oh God, no. Yeah, <laughs> we never do that. No, I mean, there's just so many problems with locking. You know, everything's a file in Unix. Yes, that's very true. Yeah, everything is a file. Thank God. Uh, even procs are a file. So, um, so I would just say that um yeah you can take a permissive lockout which says hey i i want to do this i think one of the ways around that these people have done is they 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 create a lock file and then they get a lock on the file the file isn't the lock the even though it says the lock it's not the lock it's a file that gets locked and so they'll take a lockout on that file and they'll use f lock which means that no other process that is also trying to take a lock out on that file will work. So if somebody else calls F lock on that file, it'll fail. It'll, it'll say, nope, sorry, somebody's using it right now. And then you can gracefully recover from that, right? You can say, oh, somebody else is using it. You can put yourself in a loop and you can just wait around and write your own concurrency. You can put yourself in a loop and wait for the lock to go away. And you can like, call F lock again in half a second or something. Okay, F lock's gone. Okay, you can do it. And then you can operate on the file. And as long as everybody is calling the flock syscall, which if you're using a shell script can be done using the flock command, then then everybody's happy. And that's file system locking in a nutshell. So the secret is flock and the flock syscall, which is I think in three, I want to say. Um, is it three? Is it three or is it seven? I can't remember where else it is. I think it says down here, oh, it's two. Yeah, because it's a C library. So, two. Okay, so this is the flock syscall that happens underneath when you call flock. So, and there, there is, you can call flock from Go, but this is Unix specific. So this is where we get into the, you know, underscore Unix dot Go files and stuff. Go is really cool. And that it lets you name files based on their host OS and it will only compile. It will, it's not overriding, but it essentially is the same thing. You can have like five files that are named the same and they have underscore Unix underscore window win or whatever. And when it, when it compiles on for that target OS, it'll use the one that goes with the OS. So it allows this cross platform ability, even if you have system specific things. So the point of the story there is if you want to impl implement a, a, a file system lock built into your read and write in your structure for, you know, my little config thing, then you can do it and then make it so that it's implemented using F lock on Unix and document it, you know, to that effect. And then you can also say, okay, you over here, if you're on windows, this is how we do it. Because I, I imagine the best way on windows is to actually create a file. So from what I remember, I mean, this was years ago, a decade ago, when I was working with Windows for the same sort of thing, at the time, this might have changed, but at the time, 
the default Windows file system was already atomic. You could not have two processes open the file at the same time. In fact, you get problems because in, in Windows where it says, so-and-so has this file open, you can't open it. Uh, and you'd have to go kill that process before it could you could get access to the file. Because there was, at the time, and I don't know if this has changed, but at the time, the Windows file system, how's it going? The Windows file system prevented uh, simultaneous access to a file, period. And, and so it was already guaranteed by the file system that everything was going to be atomic and there was only going to be one process that's accessing a file at any time. That means somebody else, you'd have to get really creative with how you're going to do Unix. Let's everything do whatever they can have. And that's really important for database design and other things. It makes, makes me wonder how some database engines get around that. Probably just by doing it all from a central process, I would guess in windows. I know I'm often windows la la land, but there's no F lock in windows. Maybe there is now, but at least at the time, I don't know Windows, but that would be you, the point is you can implement file system locking in a consistent way in your in the same Go library by saying, OK, underscore win dot go. You have all the rules for read and write here uh, on Windows, right, for these map file structs and stuff. And then and it would it would use something besides the, the underlying F lock functionality. But on any Unix system, any Unix system, this isn't just Linux, any any Unix system on the planet. Um, F lock has been uh, uh, an you know an advisory lock. It's been it's been a standard since the dawn of Unix, pretty much as far as I'm concerned. At least the ninety, at least ninety six, it's been that way. So this is the standard way to do that kind of lock. Now the the existence of var run lock is relatively new. I don't know when they started adding that. So when did var run lock become a thing? I don't remember seeing it anyway. <laughs> I don't remember seeing it. Cannot get locked with varlib dlock. Yeah, see, this is most more. This is what I remember. Varlib, people would put the lock files in their in their live in within their libraries. The use of var run for that kind of thing uh, is relatively new. I do like var run. Uh, var run is is a temp tempfs, a true tempfs. That means if you reboot, everything goes away, which is another reason to do var run. Because guess what? If you put your locking files in there, and you're locking by the file existing. You shouldn't be doing that, but if you are, you're saved from it because on reboot, those files get deleted. So another reason to go with the tempfs for that kind of thing. Um, said that you 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 survive, you know, system reboots and stuff. Uh, about he didn't won't start var run var varlock became the thing the thing which shouldn't be since blah blah blah. Our system was delete accidentally. How to fix could not get varlock blah. Yeah, here's here's another. This is a lock issue like the one we were just talking about. <laughs> Someone can't get a lock because somebody else is doing it. It's being held by a process. See? See what I'm saying? Make sure you have close package managers. Such as, uh, yeah, so this is actually a good thing. That means they have multiple package managers trying to get a lock on the thing and something else has got the lock on it. So that, that would actually be some good C code to read if you wanted to. Hey, Anonymous. That would be some good C code to read if you wanted to um, get your head around how to do locking. Uh, so can't lock cron up PID Unix. Uh, so yeah, in a, integration migration to slash run. Cannot correct. I wonder when it was added. I, it's gonna be a hard thing to answer because it's not the kind of question people ask on the internet. It's probably buried in some UCP news group somewhere. <laughs> I, I'm just so tired of the shit on the internet that is just yeah. <laughs> because there's just so much good information that doesn't pull up in the search engines because it's not low level stuff. Uh, you put your PID, you put your PID files of our run. That's a great idea. Yeah, people do that when they want to like kill their files and stuff. It used to be to put that in slash temp. That's bad now. The, dude, the other day I w I went to go do a mount or something and I saw I don't can't remember when it was. It was a long time ago. When I saw that slash temp was no longer a tempfs, I freaked the fuck out. I think Tony Wa and I were fighting about it. I think he's gone now. We were fighting about it. He was like, no, it's a TempFS. I'm like, no, it's not. It hasn't been a TempFS for a long time. He's like, no, it is. It definitely is. And I'm like, I couldn't believe that. That really blew my mind. It still gets deleted. So there's a good, there's lots of reasons that you would not know that it's not a TempFS anymore. <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? So if you do, God, I fuck. this is why Docker makes it so hard to reach it. Let's, let's, let me see if I can 
uh, what is it? D, D, F. There we go. So, so here's Varun. Best C code to read and learn is a commentary on the sixth edition Unix operating system by L. Jones. Ooh, ooh. Thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna put that in my list too. Lost this back in your day. Uh, what was the cause of lawsuits? The best C code, a commentary on the sixth edition Unix software. Was that, was that, was that when all the SCO lawsuits went down or was that before that? Fuck. I got to read that. I'm going to put it in my to-do list. So create uh to do read a commentary on my guidelines. Yep. I don't even care. I'm just, that's just a lame note. I don't care. Major cause. Yeah. It's a little scale thing. So here you go. Here's, here's my, my SSD, um, which is, uh, pretty full actually. It's interesting. Probably all those movies. Um, here we go. Run lock. Oh, I didn't realize run lock is its own TempFS. That's really a good reason to use it. Um, I bet you, I bet you, there's an underlying Go routine that will create a Go that under like the Unix one. I'm, I bet you there is. I bet you, I mean, I bet you there's something we can call directly. You don't have to like get crazy with it. Uh, thanks for the follow, Mike. Because he was the first one to, to completely skin the Unix sources source code to its innards, and then everyone started writing their own Unix version. Really? <gasps> and then the AT&T Berkeley guys went out. Yeah, they did. Was that the first fight? The first was BSD AT and T. I bet it was. Thank God for Apple that Berkeley went through all that shit. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was karma. Maybe it was karma that that BSD would be completely raped by Apple. <laughs> that, it could have been. It could have been karma. I I got to read it now. I would love to hear the Berkeley guys just got look. I, Berkeley, I. I'm going to say something that's going to get me in trouble. I don't care. Every time I run into somebody from Berkeley, there is some sort of academic shittiness that, 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 that just turns me the wrong way. The most recent, <laughs> but there's really great people at Berkeley. That's the thing. There's really skilled people at Berkeley. You know, JGM is a Berkeley person. The guy who invented Pandoc and common Mark and stuff or spearheaded common Mark and wrote all the RFCs for that stuff where there wasn't any before. Uh, yeah, if you don't know what I'm talking about, read it, read about it. Um, and then there was, there was, what was the other Berkeley thing I heard about recently? There was, there was a bunch of boomer, uh, boomer Berkeley hippies. You guys, you people, you have got to watch the free Amazon prime quantum mechanics documentary. It's two episodes it is so amazing. It actually, for the first time, I think I fully understand quantum entanglement or the fact that it, what, how a, both a photon and an electron are, are a quantum and how that was discovered. It is so amazing. And, and I, I don't even want to describe it because it's just so well done. It's got, it's got so many great visualizations of it and everything. And anyway, th during that documentary, there's, um, I watched that, I just finished that. Like I watched it twice now, completely through. Um, the other side lock is the PID of the process of creating the lock. It doesn't have to be, but it can be. Yeah. Yeah. That's usually, but, that, but you notice there was no PID there. They created that lock. The PID was gone at that point, but that's probably, that's probably the reason it's there. Yeah. Usually I'm just curious why it was indented and everything. And then I'm thinking it might've been because they had some sort of seeking going on in their file lock, which I don't know. Who knows what's going on. So I'm um, all over the place. The Berkeley thing though. So these guys that, um, so, they, uh, a guy named, uh, was it, uh, John Bell, John Bell, uh, blew Einstein's, uh, upset, uh, disagreement with the Copenhagen, um, take, which is the Danish guy, um, uh, what's his name, uh, who created this idea that you can't know re 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 reality is unknowable until it's detectable. And, and everybody thought it was spooky science and Einstein spent his life after that going after that theory and it was ultimately proven dead wrong over and over again by John Bell, who very quietly created this, this very simple test to see 
uh, if Einstein was wrong and nobody did it or cared about it. They just accepted it was true and they built all kinds of war machines and, and industry off of it in the 30s and 40s. It was all started by light, by, by light bulbs, by the way. The entire quantum mechanics discovery was, was created because the German industry was putting lights in their streets and there was heavy, heavy competition after they bought the, after they bought the, um, they, they bought the, the patent for medicine so they could do it. It was heavy competition. They wanted to understand why tungsten lit. They, nobody in the planet knew why tungsten got hot and got made color. They just knew it did. They didn't care. So they tried, got, they, all these people got, got organized to make it happen and figure out how to understand it. It was big money in getting, making the best light bulbs. And so that was when they discovered that, that photons behave like waves. And, and they have an experiment in there where they shoot, uh, white light or close to violet light you can still see it at, at it's called the it's called the gold leaf experiment and then they shoot red light same intensity or even more intensity and and the gold leaf will move but it won't move with the with the red light and that's because the 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 explanation from einstein was that there were the way light was behaving like a particle and and that the particles were different size so if you threw a bunch of tiny felt balls at you know a carnival you know set of cans they would not fall over but if you but if you threw a bunch of you know blue you know golf balls they would they would knock it over because they have more mass and so you have to i've talked about it before a lot i'm really interested in it but um and so the, how does this relate to berkeley um it's on the public domain the lemus group maintains a lot of unix history oh you, you found it look at you go yeah is this the John Bell discovery? Or oh, no, this is Unix. Yeah, is that Ken? Is that? No, that's. Who is that? Oh, it's Greg. It's somebody different. Copy of John Lines of Commentary on the Sixth Edition. Oh, oh, that's the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> XHTML 1.0 compliant. <laughs> It's, it's a, this is a deprecated standard that's been discarded into the trash bin of history, but it's compliant. <laughs> that's so funny. You guys remember back here when we used to label all of our stuff with CSV when we did CSV commits? Oh my God. I can't believe someone's still doing this in 2015. Poor Greg. I'm sure he's a wonderful person. Is this you? <laughs> if it is, I'm sorry. But I'm kind of just poking fun because this this is this is somebody who's living in the 1990s. It's very common, by the way, with really really educated scientists and programmers. They have no clue about HTML standards. <laughs> web, web web ring groups, yeah. So I just think it's funny. Yeah, he's even got the old logo here, and he put a he put a link to a Google search on here, so he search his site. That's cool. Yeah. Yes, they're all, all the gray wizards are still there. Yeah, they do. The gray people, they, they have no, like, do you know what? They have no fucks to give either. I, I remember Brian. I love picking up Brian. Yeah. Um, uh, Brian Ford. This guy's fucking genius. He invented Peg. Uh, that is not him. Yeah. Brian Ford info. Here we go. So here's his site. <laughs> This is his thing right here, his big face right there. It's just this genius. I mean, he's just an absolute genius, but his sight is like so disastrously bad. <laughs> it's a common thing. It's like, how shitty can I make my website? I really don't give a care. They're very links friendly. Hell yeah. <laughs> I do like it. I like it. It's 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 communication. It's an old school of commu style of communication is over flash, right? Yeah, the, the more flash you see in somebody's website, yeah, yeah, <laughs> minimalist. It really is, and you can't. the The thing about this being XML compliant, XHTML compliant, though, that just says I'm clueless. <laughs> That's. I mean, you can be the world leading expert on Unix, and if you put that you're XML 1.0 compliant on your website, there's nothing that overstates your cluelessness with regard to modern technology. <laughs> exactly. Is there a question between genius and their website? I don't know. I, I, you know, that's, that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, I'm having fun with it. I'm not attacking anybody. I just, I'm having fun. With it. It, it, it's, it's almost, it's almost inversely proportional. 
almost, you can almost say that the smarter and the more relevant a person is, the shittier their website's going to be. <laughs> you can almost say that. You can't completely say that. If they have a website at all, you know, <laughs> because they're like too busy doing shit. They're like totally like Bell. I'm sure he would never have one. The guy who, who proved Einstein wrong. <laughs> you know, he's too busy proving Einstein wrong to like give a shit about his HTML compliance. But the fact that he put the thing there to say that he's compliant means that he is like, well, hmm, okay, I, I got to <laughs> I don't know. I just think it's funny. Uh, what we got here? Granny font, granny font size. And it has you, yeah. <laughs> you got to be Times New Roman, white background, granny font. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, you know, it is what it is. I think minimal, I think you can hit minimal and still be readable. One of the, I mean, that's one of the reasons I like Pandoc's defaults that the, the, the um, John set up from Berkeley. The whole thing about the whole Berkeley thing was that there was a Berkeley, there was a Berkeley group that created these things because they wanted to prove, they wanted to validate uh, Bell's blowing away of Einstein, so that, in the words of the documentarian, they could prove that things like telepathy and other metaphysics stuff are possible when the nature of reality is no longer defined and they succeeded. <laughs> they succeeded. They proved Einstein wrong. They proved that nobody can predict ever what is going to happen with quantum until they're actually looked at. And it's just, it's fucking amazing. I really hope you guys watch it. It's just amazing. Your website's the same, but I'm not a genius. <laughs> Frank, you really going to throw that out there? All right. Well, We'll go take, we'll take a look. Hey, Frank, <laughs> I love your website. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, <gasps> you have a spinning animated GIF. Oh my God. That's awesome. <laughs> See, this is all you need, people. You don't need more than this. Of course, what's the first thing he has on here? Kerberos, <laughs> mini flash interface. <laughs> like all the JavaScript people are like, what's Kerberos? Can you tell me what Kerberos is? Is that is that like React? <laughs> Frank Bus, I just fucking make technology work. Fuck you and your React and your JavaScript. <laughs> it's like it's like Frank's Frank's site totally looks great in 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 Links too. I'm sure. It has at least it has SSL. Good point. Good point. Oh my God, Frank. Frank, dude, dude, this is beautiful, beautiful. You go one step further and like make the font and the background the same color and then the bottom put optimize for links. <laughs> I had a friend do that. I had a friend do that in the 90s. He made a website that you could not see with a graphic browser. You couldn't see it. The cover is the video website. Not the Kerberos that most people think about. Yeah. Oh, it's a it's a it's a flash. It's a different thing. I would not know that. Hi, Frank. Hi, Jenny. How are you? PlayStation Two. Hmm. Programming. Lua Player for PlayStation. Java. Good old applets. I learned those. They. I still remember them. Is Spiel? Is that stuff? Is that this Spiel means stuff? It does, right? Oh, it's a different thing. You created a flash memory for Commodore 64. Is that what that means? Oh. Wow, that's cool. Spiel equals game? No way. Spiel equals game? Really? It's okay. It's okay. We're having fun. Thanks for sharing. This is great. Palm Pilot, dude. <laughs> My ex-wife? My ex, yeah, 2014. My my ex-wife gave a church talk across the pulpit of a Mormon church using a Palm Pilot with her notes on it, and the bishop came up to her after that and said, "Oh, I'm a huge Mormon S fan, but I don't read him nearly as often as I should. I've only read Spitzeppenwolf and and uh, Siddhartha, but I read Siddhartha like six times." <laughs> I love Siddhartha. It just makes me happy. Yeah. But I don't I don't do German though. No. Uh is glass bead game. Glasperenspiel. Glasperenspiel. 
last put in spiel. Wait. I wish I could hustle and approach German girls with if you meet me at a spiel and <laughs> I don't even know. I should should I try that on my wife? She speaks German. She speaks kind of an Austrian dialect though. She doesn't speak high German. Yeah, she's over there watching like German German like stuff all the time. Yeah. Now if this is not go anymore. I should probably cancel this. People are gonna be like, we're not doing go anymore. I always do that. I kinda like decline away from the main topic. <laughs> I even declined away from my rant against Berkeley. I was going to just say that these scientists who did this thing at Berkeley, they weren't even interested in the whole topic until they could prove that telepathy and LSD was actually good for, you know, perceiving a better reality. And then they were into it. <laughs> it's like, okay, science for hippies, um, which is fine. You know, I'm kind of hippie. Used to work at a hostel. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You worked at a hostel? How do you work at a hostel? I thought hostels were like free and shit. Oh, God. What are you doing, Jenny? You know, the FBI released documents on them studying astral projection and whatnot. Did they really? I did not. Okay, so if you study the quantum, we should probably change to just chatting, but the best Palm Pilot video ever. All right, we will end with a, we will end uh, CIA. Yeah. Dude, it doesn't surprise me at all. They're, they're, the Chinese are already using lasers to communicate across the world in a 100% secure way that cannot be broken. Encryption that is broken by looking at it. And it's it's not pseudoscience. It's real. It's crazy. It's like real science. It's like reproducible. They just found a robin. There's a robin. They're calling it the quantum robin now in England. They put a hood over one of its eyes and they found out that its eyes are using... Uh, they're using its eyes are using photonic entanglement across both of its eyes to tip the scales of the magnetic of the of the magnetic magnetic stuff that it can't determine up up above so that it, its brain can detect which direction it's flying, and it's the only biological explanation that they have for it. And so now they're they're discovering um, quantum mechanics in the biological world. So now they're saying that enzymes enzymes are being the ability for an enzyme to like for example. Uh, dissolve a, a tadpole's a tadpole's tail and turn it into a frog, which happens at crazy rates that are way faster than anything else in the biological world. And they know that it's because of enzymes, because enzymes are super magical. They're able to transform chemical bonds that are normally really hard to break down, and they do it in a way that that has been magical to scientists forever. And now they're starting to see that the that the electrons that are involved in the enzyme are probably behaving like quantum, which means they can go right through stuff that normally they couldn't. And and they're shifting over, and they use the analogy of a not a square knot tied with, you know, in two different ways. One way is easy to tie untie, and the other one isn't. Uh, and so it's it's just fucking amazing. So so right now the leading science on how enzymes work is, which is every fucking living thing pretty much, right, is based on quantum mechanics. The the migrations of the monarch butterfly and the and the, the 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 quantum robin that they're studying are also based on not just magnetic magnetic determination of the poles, but also at the addition of potential photonic entanglement that's being detected by both of the eyes and the robin. Because when they close one eye, it doesn't operate the same way, and they close the other eye, it it, it it's whole it's whole magnetic uh, stuff fails, which means that its its magnetic compass is dependent on light particles. And it's just insane. So then the the other thing that they're they're figuring out is um, is the third one that the, the biological connection is DNA itself. So they actually are, they're looking at why is uh, they they're the current best biological theory is they're now suggest suggesting it's not a theory but they're suggesting that the reason that we have genetic mutation is because there are problems happening in. They're, they're, you know, in the in the, the molecules that cause it. Otherwise, you get a perfect copy every time, right? But now they're suggesting that there is some quantum mechanics that might be re related that's causing the breakdown of some of these molecules to reattach. And so genetic mutation is fundamentally tied to quantum mechanics, quantum phenomena, which are dependent on this 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 idea of there being some sort of, of pool or they don't even have an explanation for a body of, of, of things that are communicating particles and waves that are, that are, that are completely undetectable. And it's just crazy. It's just so neat, but it, it, the way things are going, they're starting to find out that, that really, that 
it, as one scientist said it, that it's just easier. It's just easier. The, the nature has this nature is lazy and it discovers things that are easier. So the entire chlorophyll process is all, it's all quantum mechanics. The generation of ATP by every human thing, every living thing on planet earth originates with quantum mechanics through, through the, the process of, 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 of chlorophyll uh, processing of sunlight, right? Sun energy. It's just insane. So, uh, Max Planck Institute. Yep. Yeah. Since 2000. In fact, they talked that they talked about Planck. Planck was one of the ones who of course originally found all that stuff. Right. Uh, but it was, it was Bell Labs actually that discovered that electrons behave like particles. So, so it was the light bulb people. Uh, it was the light bulb people that figured out that light behaved and then Einstein cracked the problem. They didn't know why, but Einstein cracked the problem and figured out that light behaved like a, like a particle, but it took the Bell Labs people to figure out that electrons also acted like a particle. The, the craziest experiment, please watch it. It is this craziest thing ever. So they started the experiment by spanning like electrons through two slits and they saw that the electrons manifested the wave pattern on the on the back background, suggesting that the particles for the electrons that were going were, were you know, spotting up and they, but they didn't just, they didn't separate them out one at a time. And so relatively recently, the real huge discovery is that they started firing one electron through a specific slit, whether the left or the right. And it still manifested the same wave properties, even though it was just one electron, which out, which rules out the possibility that all the electrons were coming together and creating some sort of wave effect at the same time by firing the single electron. And that means that the electron is still a part of, of some system that we can't complain, understand currently that causes it to behave like a wave, even if there's nothing else associated with it fired. It's just so fucking crazy. It's so fucking crazy. You just have to watch it. Uh, as the media likes to make us out to be. Yeah. I don't, I don't think we are. I mean, yeah, I, it was, it did, uh, enter, interferometers are magical. I haven't even played with those yet. Interferometers. Yeah. Bad League of Legends. <laughs> Horrible man talking about God knows what. I hope you guys get the ref. Lol. Uh, still not as good as the Palm Pilot video. Oh, wait. Where's my Palm Pilot video? Did I pull it up? <laughs> I'm going to pull up the Palm Pilot, 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 Palm Pilot video. Wait, that's not it. Oh, wait. Wait, 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 wait. Shit. Start to slip in any subject. <laughs> so I've come up with these academic alerts. You will receive one as soon as your grades start to slip in any subject. <laughs> this way, your parents won't have to wait until report card time to punish you. How innovative. I like it. Hey, Dolph, take a memo on your Newton. Beat up Martin. <laughs> 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 that is pretty damn good. I won't lie, that is really good. I was at my workstation when suddenly Attention I'm gonna get banned workers. here. Your plant has been taken over by an all-star team of freelance terrorists. Not on my shift! Yep. <laughs> oh I mean, The Simpsons is one of the few cartoons I really miss. I need to do I need to do Ren and Stimpy. I need to and I need to do some of the some, some of the old stuff stuff. Uh, I also need to take a break actually. So I'm gonna take a break. I'll play I'm gonna play a few games. I come back. I don't know what I'm gonna play yet, but um, this is all really good. I'm I'm glad we went through this. I feel like I have a much better handle on the interface I want to make and what I want to accomplish there. It's just a con configuration library, but that's. It's not just a configuration library. It's the configuration library that I'm going to use for everything. So this is the kind of stuff, yeah. CIO cult stuff, how goofy government funded stuff can get. Oh, God. Absolutely. Absolutely agree with that. Um, definitely agreed. Um, yeah. Uh, crazy. Yeah. So I'm going to be off the go topic. Uh, I'm going to be canceling YouTube for now because I'm going to be listening to music and stuff. So if you're out on YouTube, thank you for stopping by and we'll be doing some more go probably tomorrow. I don't know what time. Just watch for the schedule. If I'm going to do something, I'll put it on the schedule, but I deleted all the default stuff off the schedule because 
because I didn't want to have, you can't really, well, I'm just going to add one at a time <laughs> instead of like the regular. So if you look at that, uh, this, they spend money on witchcraft. Hey, if it's effective, 